recording on my computer. And I'm now muting myself. Okay. Well, welcome to the live portion of the 2021. Sorry, one more second. So Sorry. forget that. <laughs> so we're going to be split screen the whole time, right? Um, the, Except the recording is just going to show who's talking. Okay. So basically, it's going to be ready in five seconds. I'll wait for your sign. Okay. Welcome to the live portion of the 2021 virtual North American Conference of the Barbara Pym Society. At noon today, the winning entries of the Ellen J. Miller Memorial Short Story Competition were posted online. And after this, at 3.30, will be the world premiere of the video play of an unsuitable attachment. But now we have the pleasure of meeting the authors of the conference papers that were posted Monday through Thursday of this past week. <clears throat> As part of um, their introductions, I asked them uh, which PIM character they would choose to have dinner with. So we got some interesting responses. In the order in which their papers were posted, our speakers are Celia Bland. You wanna wave Celia? <laughs> I guess your name is there, except for um, a certain Cynthia. Her name is Angus. <laughs> yes, I'm Angus today for whatever reason, yeah. So Celia Bland and, and her paper compared, interestingly, the late novels of Barbara Pym with Raymond Chandler. Celia teaches poetry at Bard College in Annandale, New York, and is associate director of the Bard College Institute for Writing and Thinking. Her choice of dinner partner is Everard Bone interesting. Perhaps you'd have a bird for your meal. Secondly, on Tuesday was Christine J uh, Jacobson, uh, who spoke on women bibliographers and indexers in um, Barbara Pym's novels. Christine is assistant curator of modern books and manuscripts at Harbors Houghton, Houghton Library. She would like to have dinner with food critic Adam Prince from A Few Green Leaves, since they would be sure to eat well. Third is Angus there, Cynthia Boyd, who uh, looked at material culture in the lives of female characters in an unsuitable attachment. Uh, Cynthia is a part-time lecturer at Memorial University in Newfoundland in the Department of Folklore. Cynthia says that she would like to have both dinner and then breakfast with Sophia Anger, I don't know if that's how you say her name, but Anger. So I, I so she said she could enjoy her homemade quince jelly. And finally, we have Father Nathan Mulcock, who spoke on Pim's surprisingly contemporary curates. He was until recently an assistant curate himself, but he's completed his curacy. And have you now, have you started or are you still waiting to start your uh, religious vocation with the community of Resurrection Murphy. Uh, I'm, I'm going up there on the 7th of April. Oh, okay. All right. So about yes. to start. His <laughs> dinner partner choice is Piers Longridge because he says they share a similarly cavalier attitude toward punctuality for dinner engagements and he'd never decline another bottle of wine for the table. So welcome to our guests and we're looking forward to, to having a discussion. I do have questions, many of which have come from our viewers uh, and I encourage them to talk among themselves if, if um, you know, say I'm gonna start with Father Nathan and if one of the others of you like that question or want to comment on it, please feel free. So Father Nathan. This is from Isabel. <clears throat> Isabel says, and this is a little bit long question, but it leads to a nice question. You discuss Barbara Pym's feckless curates, Latimer, Dunn, and Ransom, and observe that they do not grow or learn humility. In Pym's last novel, A Few Green Leaves, the Reverend Tom Dagnall is not a very pro promising specimen of the clergy either. 
We know that Pam herself was a committed Anglican. Do you think she saw, what, what do you think were her hopes? And this would be conjecture, but what do you suppose Barbara Pym hoped for the Anglican church? Do you think she saw a few green leaves on the old branches of that institution? Um, yeah, well, uh, it's, it's not an original insight of mine, but um, I recall, you know, kind of the, the pointing out that the, the fact that, um, um, that ultimately Tom Dagnall is picked was kind of the, the, the sign of, of maybe that there's something in this. Right. Um, in in this strange institution that does seem to be kind of uh, fading away. Um, I mean, uh, and from what I did read about kind of uh, from her life and diaries, she, she, you know, her, her interests still seem to be very much fixed on kind of the clergy, like even if society wasn't quite so interested uh, for herself, uh, as far as I can gather. Um, she, there was something still worthwhile there. Uh, I have my own opinion. Um, what the, but, uh, <laughs> do you feel comfortable sharing that? Or? <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I, COVID's uh, definitely thrown up a lot of challenges. Um, uh, I think the more cynical of my colleagues were convinced we'd have death by a thousand small cuts over the next 40 years, but um, we're probably facing a lot of questions over the next five years now um uh as the funds have kind of dried up uh yeah. for churches that can't support themselves oh. um i think um the encouragement though I, I i kind of take from pim is is that actually uh the church kind of persists uh, in spite of its clergy uh, a lot of the time um the you know and, the, and and the congregations that make up these communities see them come and they see them go um, and, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there's something enduring about, about the laity's involvement, really. Okay. Um, and that's where I put my hope, thank yeah. you. Good. Uh, I have further, further on in the hour, I have a couple of questions that kind of address that last uh, bit that you just mentioned about uh, it going on despite the clergy. Thank you. Um, this one is from Susan for Christine. And Christine wants to know what would be the typical educational background um, for, for women bibliographers, indexers, and librarians that were you mentioned in your talk or either in real life or in Barbara Pym's novels. She says, we are told by Pym that Viola Dace was working on her PhD and that Prudence Bates and Dulcie Mannering have undergraduate degrees from Oxford but I do not believe Pim mentions whether Ianthe Broom or Mildred Lathbury has a university degree. Would you just talk in general, well, specifically about this novel, if you can, or in general about um, what would have been their training? Sure. Um, my knowledge of this is kind of a Frankensteining of the American context and the, the British context. Um, I uh, am really interested in the history of Oxford and, and women studying at Oxford. And I know that Oxford didn't really start admitting students until um, the late 1870s, um, but, he, but they didn't actually allow them to receive degrees until 1920 was the first matriculation for women um, at Oxford. Um, but even then, and some of you may know this, there was a there was a quota in place until 1957, oh, yeah. where uh, only a quarter of the women you could only admit a quarter of women relative to the male population at Oxford, um, which is just really astonishing uh, to me. So yes, of course, in the in the early to mid 20th century, women are getting undergraduate uh, degrees at Oxford, but that that number was necessarily limited. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, the sort of background and training that an indexer might have, I think it's interesting that this is a period where a lot of that experience is, is informal. Um, mm -hmm. You might look for someone like Mildred um, or Viola who has an undergraduate degree or in Viola's case worked on a PhD, um, but usually there's no formal training involved or at this period there wasn't uh, any formal training involved for women. They would um, pick this work up 
um, either for um, a friend or a loved one um, and sort of learn it by, by doing it, um, which is sort of, th that's sort of uh, an interesting practice across bibliographic labor, I think. Um, I have a degree in library science, but I learned how to do my job entirely on the job. Um, and I think that's, that's something that a lot of those careers um, have in common. Um, so I hope that begins to answer the question. Yeah. Can I jump in here, Kathy and Christine? Yes, I just, just to try to answer that question, whether there was anything in the novel that indicated mm -hmm. Ianthe had actual, you know, some training, um, two things. One, I don't think there was an actual reference to her having had a university education, for instance, but there's sort of that thing. And I think Christine, you actually make, make that direct quote about uh, how her mother wanted her to have a nice job, like in a library, you know, there was that, you know, that, you know, uh, stereotype we'll say. And, but there's sort of, there's an insinuation because of course, is it Mervyn? Is that how we say his name? Mer Mer yeah, I mean, He's such a snob, right? I mean, he's such a snob. But at the same time, he respects Ianthe. I call her Ianthe, by the way. I know you said a different way, Christine. But anyway, Ianthe, he respects Ianthe more than John. So it makes me wonder if she did, or there's a there's assumption, Pim has made the assumption that Ianthe did have more knowledge or because she has this moneyed background and the hepa white chairs and the Pembroke table and da 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 that Merwin appreciates so much. But it makes me wonder if Merwin appreciated Ianthe, bottom line, because Pim's assuming that we as readers would assume she had some training. Thank you for bringing that up, Cynthia. Um, it actually does mention super briefly that after her father dies, she does get training uh, oh, in okay. librarianship. And um, what I assume this refers to is uh, in, in the mid, century, a lot of women um, and some men would get training in librarianship by taking a certification course, okay. um, which had, which looks different depending on where you are um, in the context. Belle D'Agosta Green, um, the librarian for um, uh, the Morgan Library in New York City, like famously, like took one certification course and then became the most oh, powerful okay. librarian in the United yeah. States. I've been um, to that library. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's what that that cool. looks like, and it's like usually a month or two. Um, not wow. not completely unlike um, the secretary certification that some women would, women would get before the rise of like secretary schools. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, this one is for Celia from Deb. <clears throat> You've highlighted highlighted the similarities between Barbara Pym and Raymond Chandler very well. Are there any other unlikely authors where you've noticed similarities with Pam? And this might be one that all of you might have something oh, yeah. to say, but Celia. Well, I was just, um, my husband was just suggesting um, Philip Larkin, that oh. uh, his last book of poetry is The High Windows, and Chandler has a novel called The High Window. Um, but there's n really no connection. <laughs> beyond the title, I think. Um, I was thinking about, um, and this is about Chandler, I was just thinking as I was reading the paper for the, for the film, you know, that, which was actually a, a really arduous process in, in a funny way to read. I mean, I'm sure you, you felt the way, same way, but I really learned a lot from it. Like, I, it's almost as if I understood what I had written so much better mm. because I read it out loud and um, a few times. Um, but I was thinking about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and how that connected to the long goodbye. For Barbara Pym, um, I was thinking more about um, Lucky Jim and Kingsley Amos and how uh, there's a happy ending in that novel um, after so many humorous and um, just um, the acuity of his critique of academia is just so wonderfully funny and so apt. Um, and I was thinking about that in, in terms of um, an academic question. Anybody else have, you know, people are always wanting to know of writers whose books are 
very like Barbara Pym, but to think about ones that seem on the surface completely different, but do have, as you said, the Venn, Venn diagram commonalities. Um, mm. yeah. Well, of course, you know, everybody knows that Pym has often been compared to Jane Austen multiple yeah. times. Um, I don't always see the similarity, but then as Christine knows, I've mentioned to Christine, I'll confess it to all the people viewing. I haven't read all of Pym's books. So um, it's pretty it's pretty recent stuff to me, uh, but I dabbled a little bit. And uh, at Christmas, I was at a secondhand bookstore, well, actually, sorry, a year ago at Christmas in Vancouver. And I stumbled across uh, a copy of one of her books and I was so excited to find a secondhand copy anyway. And, uh, and, I ha and my husband didn't realize that the book pile that we had for secondhand books was, was it was for me and he gave it to his mother. <laughs> so I'm really hoping I get it back. But, but the very good thing in that is that in talking to her after she read A Few Green Leaves and I haven't, cause I don't have a copy, you know, anyway, um, she made a reference to Jane Austen, and then she made a reference to um, an American writer, I could have it, Grace Pelly, P-E-L-L-E-Y, who writes uh, short Paley. stories. It, what's Paley. her last name, sorry? Paley. Paley, yeah. And that, and again, I have a short, I've read a couple of her short stories, but it was, it was neat in a way to have that connection because um, my mother-in-law knew I was doing this conference. So I'm really glad that she got the book because, you know, we were, we've been chatting about Barbara Pym and she had never, she's in her nineties. She had never read Barbara Pym. Yeah. So that was exciting and a good discovery. And I got over the, you know, I'll get the book back at some point, in, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but that was an interesting connection. So I immediately read some of Grace Patey's work and, uh, and I did see certain that there wasn't so much the curate, but there was certainly that combination of village community um, and that wholeness that people feel, even though there's the there's the gossip and the this sort of thing, but that village community aspect was really strong in the Grace Beatty. Yeah, good. I Thank just you. one one of the things Go I love ahead. so much about sorry um, about Celia's paper was that um, the Raymond Chandler comparison is so surprisingly. Um, well, I guess what I would say is it really does help me think about Barbara Pym's novels in a fresh way. And I think, you know, when I've tried to get people to read her before, I always fall back on Trollope and Austin. Um, and I had this dual experience of listening to Celia's paper. Um, and I happen to love Raymond Chandler. And and I think he what he's doing with the sort of noir genre is really sort of experimental and interesting. Like as Celia points out, that the point isn't really to solve the mystery. It's to kind of like, take this journey with Marlowe and for all of your assumptions to be upended. Um, and so this dual experience of listening to Celia's paper and then reading this um, London review of books, re review of An Unsuitable Attachment when it came out um, by Marilyn Butler. Uh, and um, sh I shared this with, with Cynthia. I, when I first read it, I thought it was a negative review, but I had to read it a couple of times and ask my husband who teaches um, literature to help me understand it. And she's arguing that, that the reason she thinks that an unsuitable attachment was rejected by Cape wasn't because it was unfashionable, but was because um, it's an experimental novel. It's a sort of purely functionalist novel, this sort of literary tradition she's been playing with in the first couple of novels, but really hones in on this novel where she's really interested in like, okay, here's how um, one cell and its components interact with other um, cells and their components and you put them in a variety of situations and it's like very, very formal. Um, and you can kind of see this in Ian's we're constantly told um, her, uh, the way she, she dresses and the way that she acts and the things that she has in her house, but we're never shown them. And that's, that's very much on purpose. That's not an accident. And so I'm sorry to, to ramble here a bit, but just oh, the, the, this dual experience has really, um, changed the way that I read Barbara Pym. Um, and it's funny, there's a, there's a bit at the end of this review where she talks about, um, Marilyn Butler refers to Barbara Pym discussing how she thinks it's ironic that she's constantly compared to Jane Austen because that is not a tradition that she herself is drawing from at all. Um, so 
wondering if anybody else has read this review, thoughts on this? Kind of a word salad, I'm sorry. Well, that's so interesting. I love yeah. hearing about that. I attended a lot of lectures by Marilyn Butler when I was in college and um, she was you know, specialized in the romantics mm -hmm. and revolution. So such an interesting, I mean, to see him as a radical in this way, a kind of radical formalist or, um, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, I think you made the point in your paper that she was ahead of her time in the same way that Chandler, that both of them were not comfortable in the 60s and they essentially were ahead of time? I think both of them were very interested in, I mean, I, I was thinking about this um, this morning that Pam in many ways is asking the question, what is a woman for? You know, she's for comfort. She's she's there to type or make an index for you. She'll make you something hot to drink um, for entertaining, you know, for looking nice. Um, um, but what else is she for? And I think Chandler is always asking, what is a man for? You know, that there are all these characters throughout his novels who cannot be the hero. You know, they lack some important element. They would like to be the hero, but they cannot be heroic. And what does Marlowe have that allows him to be a hero and yet never really reap the mm -hmm. fortune or, right. or praise that mm -hmm. comes from that? Just as Pym's heroines never quite get the, it's not the golden ring, I would say. It's just not the, they're, they're never really offered the pedestal. <laughs> <laughs> They, they're constrained always, but even when they get what they want or some part of what they want, it, it's always so true to life, I think, in that when you get it, when you finally get that thing you've been hoping for, that you, um, it's at the wrong moment or you have to kind of adjust your expectations in order to be happy having it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Christina, you also uh, spoke about how Pym's portrayal of librarians and indexes was actually ahead of its time as well. That wasn't that you who did that. Who um, that it was the 1970s where that was the first decade that you know sort of shook off the stereotype of the dusty, dusty librarian. And you spoke about um, Ianthe being elevated above John actually in a kind of role reversal that she reversed that trope of the, you know, the pretty young girl who marries the older distinguished librarian. So yeah, yeah, they, they both are not sort of of their time. Um, I rather think that, that at least Pim is ageless. <laughs> she, she's a, a woman for all seasons at all times, but that's my opinion. <laughs> Anything else about that? Um, Christina, I loved that point that Kathy yeah. just alluded to about John being the younger, prettier, right. sort of ingenue of the, of, of the library. Yeah, I felt kind of bold making that argument. Um, and I, I think it needs to be developed a little bit more. But when I was reading um, through these old uh, articles from um, library history and reading about how there was all this concern about women leaving the profession and getting married, I thought, well, that's John Chalo. <laughs> he doesn't last very long in that library. No, no, um, and he does very well for himself attracting Ianthea. So it's my hot take. <laughs> Cynthia, um, here's a question. Your discussion of Pim's use of the details of material culture to represent her characters' lives highlights a particular characteristic of Pim's writing. Would you talk a little bit more about how such details help or enhance our understanding of character? Um, I mean, basically that's what your paper was about, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about the importance of material culture uh, in, 
and how that creates or defines character or does it maybe it doesn't mm. thank you kathy uh that's a really good question um i should put it in right into perspective right away and be very confessional in saying that i am a folklorist not a literary person so uh i looked at pym particularly obviously unsuitable attachment as a folklorist and to some degree, very similarly, as an anthropologist might look at Pym, which we all know is very strongly connected to Pym and her work mm -hmm. uh, it, with uh, the journal Africa. Um, but, you know, obviously I read, <laughs> so I don't have to be a literary specialist to see that, to me, um, the way that Pym develops her characters and I say this in my paper, so I'm sort of reiterating it, but I know what it's like when you're listening to a paper or reading a paper, it doesn't always sink in and you have to let this material process or, well, at least I do anyway, I have to let things process. Um, but I, I find with Pim, and I've only, like I say, I haven't read all her books, I've only read about three of them, but she loves to put herself in a lot of those characters. And, I guess on the very general perspective is that she's a, you know, a, a vibrant, brilliant woman who also can fry up an egg of an evening. Um, and yet there's another side of her that I think comes out in the characters through material culture, such as the dress, especially Penelope Granison. Oh my God, that woman, I, I, she was a close second to have breakfast with um, other than her sister, Sophia, but there's something about Sophia and that damn quince fruit that I just can't stop thinking about sometime. But anyway, there's something about Penelope that to me is Pim and like her character and how she's, she's bright, uh, she's vibrant, but she's just a little bit insecure. Oh, there goes my phone. Hold on a sec. I'll get rid of it. <laughs> I thought it was mine, which I put in another room. <laughs> um, that's going to happen again. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll keep going. But so what I find about Pim is that she's just so fabulous with detail and, uh, you know, the experience of clothing and the way it's used and the way it's incorporated and the way it just Oh, it just angers Penelope in so many situations. But the split dress, I mean, that's got to be one of my favorite scenes. Um, and, and how all the women try to gang in and try to help. And again, that, pers that whole perspective of the women, like a village helping each other, trying to figure out well, how they're going to save poor Penelope from having that split dress. Um, is that sort of, it's almost like an... Uh, an enlargement of the idea of a, an object like dress defining that character drawing her out mm -hmm. and then it's being added to by the women kind of coming together and saying good god what are we going to do you know how can we save this poor thing the embarrassment um and as women today and it doesn't have to be necessarily women men too but it's just the idea that we we can all appreciate that awful experience of putting on something that was just a little bit too tight yeah. and you ate too much and we can all appreciate that and so that's where Pim shines in my opinion because the objects the things that she loves that her characters love and I would suspect her readers love or maybe even just appreciate um they 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 make that person so much larger and greater and more human I don't know if that helps, but maybe you guys can all chip excellent. in. Yeah, excellent point. Well, well, well I love that about uh, uh, that, that kind of thing. But there, there is, I, I, I almost feel, um, cause, because uh, Pym has a bit of a folk memory uh, in the Church of England, you see. So there, there are, I, I was talking to somebody about this and, and, and then they said they knew somebody who knew her when she was an undergraduate, uh, um, when they were minding the church or whatever. And, and, and his opinion was she was a nightmare uh, as an undergraduate, you know, sort of, sort of chasing after the men and kind of this, this intense interest um, in people um, that I think a lot of people found quite off-putting. Um, so um, 
you know, I think I think finding that positive thing, there's almost this this kind of, um, you know, this, this ideal self almost going into the novels as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That actually, uh, th there's part of me that almost likes to think she's she's actually rethinking how she would have done things um, had she ah, been in the situation herself, point. almost. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of brilliant, Nathan. Better, yeah, uh, that's, that's good. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. No. Well, back to Cynthia, I, just to, oh, for one second, I just I thought ahead. that focusing on the objects in Barbara Pym was a really brilliant way to read the books because she does focus so, um, so almost obsessively on you know furnishings and what's on the table, and um, I think about Crampton Hodnet where it opens with yes. that room and they're expecting the party mm -hmm. and where things are and what people bring and where they put it and mm -hmm. that they knock it over and then they hide it and then they, you know, that it really is a way almost of, if it were a play, you know, it, 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 it's, it's the stage directions. Mm -hmm. for oh, that's character. a good point, yeah. And I, I, I so enjoyed that approach. It, oh, thank you. It's so much mm -hmm. sense because you're thinking about both the, the China and the tea within it. But through that, you can discuss the manners, the frustrations, the um, sort of tendrils of uh, anticipation or of uh, disapproval that move through the conversation. Yeah, and thank you, Celia. I, I, uh, I'm just thinking, to, as thinking as you're speaking, but obviously listening to you fully. Um, I love the scene when uh, the woman, she's such a minor character, she's almost like minutiae, um, who she's at the party when, uh, and I can't remember her name, I'm sorry, but she makes a reference to the paisley, sort of almost a large paisley scarf that's, that Rupert's used to drape on a, on a bed. And it's in, in the room, I guess. And uh, yeah. And they're going to haul that off the bed and cover that up. Um, but the whole idea of Paisley being something of another period, really, um, anyway, is an interesting reference to an earlier time in Pym's life, too, I think. Anyway, sorry, Kathy, I didn't mean to go on. No, that's, no, that's wonderful. <laughs> I don't want to stop anybody. No, I'm good. I, was, I just okay. wanted to say right. that I thought there was a really interesting thread through all three of your papers and note, noticing played a different role in each paper um, in Celia's noticing mm -hmm. as detection, as sleuthing. Uh, yeah. and, and obviously notice Barbara Pym's noticing furnishes all of the material culture that you described, um, Cynthia. And then Nathan, oh, you had this... Um, paragraph where you quoted um, Simone Weil and about how unmixed attention is a form of prayer or maybe the, the yeah. most sincere form of prayer I don't quite remember um, and how this allows the characters in the novel to um, to you know find beauty in the overlooked and uh, um, something in the mundane it was just it was really great um, and so I wanted to compliment all three of you on that. Thank you, thank you. I just received flowers from my husband to congratulate me on the conference. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> wonderful. Yes, very kind, yeah. Keep that man. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Were they violets? Uh, good point. Uh, no, they're carnations and calla lilies. It's fine, perfect, oh. I don't care. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, back to Father Nathan. Uh, we actually have a two-part question, two different questions essentially from Scott. So I'll do the first one first. Pym's men are notoriously feeble characters. Do you think her curates are a special case or are they exemplars of, a more, of the more general male? <laughs> if you can answer that. Do you think that, in other words, are her feeble curates just every man? Yeah, I, um, I'm just I'm just trying to load up. I had I had a little table of, of things Pim said about men. Um, in <laughs> my in God, 
<laughs> and uh, you know, wow. it's not pretty reading. Um, uh, <laughs> that's the way. That's, the way. There, that's impressive, Nathan. There's there's definitely a, a reference somewhere where she, you know, I think I think it's in Crampton Hodnet where where the, you know, there's this observation about the men shopping and they all look like chained bears being sort of dragged around is, is kind of the, the, the metaphor that's used. Um, uh, I think um, probably what I find separates the curates, of course, is, is that, um, is almost that transience, of course, is, is that you meet other men and they're useless in their, their special ways, but they're, they're kind of settled. Um, they have wives to rescue them. Uh, they have, uh, you know, their, their situation is quite stable, but the, the curate kind of passes through. And so he's sort of left with only his lackluster wit, really, to kind of get him through every awkward situation. Nobody's going to step in for him uh, until the end of the novel when, when he finally meets uh, the future Mrs. So-and-so. Um, and so I think, I think uh, yeah, the, the curate does kind of stand out in that, that sense. Um, um, and, and because he's always sort of changing, really, through the novel. Um, well, yeah, he, doesn't, he doesn't have quite the anchors that the other character, the male characters have, necessarily. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Um, the second, second part of his question, and actually Deb asked a similar one, so I'll ask both of them. And, and the others of you, too, might be interested in answering this. If Pam were writing now, <clears throat> or just a bit later than her own time, would we find excellent curates among female clergy? And this Deb asked, if Barbara Pym were writing about curates today, what major changes would she need to make to plot, to the plot? Or would she? What do you think? What would she do with female curates today? Mm. Hmm. I think she'd be quite. Are you mute. stopped? Is everyone stopped? <laughs> there, there, there's, there's, there is a moment in the Glass of Blessings, isn't there, where they discuss kind of female clergy, and basically it's it's they're all going to have bowl cuts and be sort of middle-aged women oh. who who don't know what they're doing with their lives. Uh, sort of, I'll see if I can find it. Um, you know this, uh, and and uh, in some ways um, there was some prescience about that. There's still an issue in, in recruiting younger women, actually, into full-time uh, ministry uh, in this country. Um, they do tend <coughs> to uh, enter into it having had a career in a family, actually, uh, to some extent, quite often. Um, so, you know, in, in that way. Uh, what was the rest of the question? I've already forgotten. I, I... Um... Would she have to, it, oh, if she were writing about curates today, that is male curates, I guess, what major changes would she need to make to the plot, or would she? Would, are, are curates from the novels of Barbara Pym when she wrote, you know, during her time, different from, <laughs> maybe this is an impossible question, but are they different from curates today, and would she have to, to portray them differently? Would she have to change the plots, do you think? I think um, just going on the strength of kind of the kind of the peer groups and the training, um, you know, every curate brings their inexperience to the role. Oh. Um, every curate brings their their bravado. You know, they've been to college. They've had some ideas. They've they've thought about what church should be like um, before they've actually met real people. Um, so there's always that kind of disconnect. Um, yeah. which I think she captures brilliantly um, in her writing. So that would be the same today as well. That would be the, that would be the same. Oh. Um, I think actually thinking back to that first question, of course, if you have kind of female curates and female clergy, um, would she write about them differently? Um, I don't think she'd necessarily put them in the same mold as, as, uh, as kind of these, these tame animal male curates. Um, Necessarily, I think. I think, yeah. Um, it's a good question. I have to think more about it, to be honest. Um, Anybody else well, have I, an opinion? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say something. Sorry, did I jump in on someone else? Sorry. No. Nope. Um, um, I was just 
thinking off the cuff here. Um, I'm thinking about the curate in, uh, I've got red ink on my face. Isn't that attractive? Sorry. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, just, I was just doodling and now, now I look like I have a, you know, breaking out in brown mustard. Anyway, um, an aside, definitely an aside. Um, I'm thinking about the scene in um, Ian, For Ian Forrester's A Room with a View mm -hmm. uh, of the curate that is so helpful to Lucy and her, her uh, I guess, is it her aunt or I can't remember who I'm just, I'm thinking of uh, that scene where the curate helps her, helps them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just thinking of that in terms of how would Ian Forrester write about the, the, uh, people today who, who choose that vocation and it's a really interesting question and it, I would I, I certainly have been a little stumped by it but um, I think Pim would look at if you think about how she also uh, makes reference to Sister Do in uh, uh, an unsuitable attachment mm -hmm. where a Sister Do is like you know the way she dresses she sort of typecast a little bit but there's sort of an element to Sister Do that Sophia makes reference to. The Sister Do is an accomplished cook and baker. And you sort of think, oh, that's, you know, although it's a nun or the, the assumption is that she's a nun, um, you know, that's exciting to me that even in the sixties, the reference to a nun having some ability domestically is kind of cool because you think of, oh, well, a nun is, you know, they're very staid, they pray a lot, they're, you know, so there's sort of those expectations I certainly have reading that, having been to Catholic school and knowing fully well that I don't know any nun that cooked very well, frankly, because the food they cooked, you know, was done by a cafeteria when I grew up and it was terrible. So I would love a sister do to be in my life who, you know, was domestically <laughs> Uh, achieving as well as having that religious background. So it's kind of interesting. I think, again, this reiterates that Pim was way ahead of her time. I, I know though, I, I think that it would be very difficult. I mean, as, as Nathan brought before us so well, the half starved, starved um, curate and who is so eager to accept the hospitality of the church ladies, you know, and um, mm. the special meals, the mufflers, um, the fruit and jellies. Mm. It's hard to imagine anyone doing that for women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> curates. That they they themselves are knitting for mm. someone else. Mm. Uh, they themselves are making the jelly. It would be. It would require that there be an equivalent of. Um, Belinda and Harriet, that would be maybe um, male and uh, very interested in the, you know, it's just it, for the, the sexual politics of the novels to work out. I wonder how that would work. It'd be very interesting to think about. Mm, it's a great question. Um, I should also say I finally found the, it was actually in a glass of blessings that all the men are like performing bears on a chain, um, was the, was the quote. Um, say that again, all the men are what? Uh, performing bears on a chain. Oh, performing bear, okay, right. And this yeah. is, uh, Nathan, this is men in general or the curate? Yes. Oh, men generally, oh. Yeah. Wow. Oh, dear. Interesting. Yeah. I have one more question, a quick question for uh, Nathan from Barry. He wondered if, if you have ever, if you found yourself identify, identifying with any of Barbara Pym's curates. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to answer that. <laughs> uh, no, I'll be honest. Um, um, all of them at different points, oh. uh, I think, um, particularly that sense of stupefaction um and actually there's there's a little crossover with with trollope um and i think it's in barchester towers himself where he he has a little aside about kind of young curates and how do they you know have the confidence to to go up to the pulpit um and preach to these venerable old greybeards who have who have so much experience of life you know and, and tell them what the gospel actually is and, and so on. 
Uh, but then, you know, of course, they always seem to carry themselves off well enough uh, on the occasion. Um, but yeah, that definitely, there's, there's these moments, of course, um, and, and parish work, you're, you're still involved in, in kind of life and death stuff. And there's these people that have experienced so much and they're looking at you and, and you know, you've got absolutely nothing, nothing that you could say. Um, um, and perhaps if there's one thing I've learned from reading Pym is that sometimes actually just sitting quietly and saying nothing is probably the best policy because whatever you can say is going to be fantastically inadequate mm. to the, uh, the situation. Um, uh, you know, and you do feel all those, those kind of dynamics of, of sort of age and experience and uh, gender sometimes, yeah. of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I get where they're coming from, really. <laughs> It's hard to know nothing and, uh, you know, <laughs> pretend you know everything um, when, when you think people need that. But, but over time, you learn that people don't need that in the same way. They, they, they've got it in themselves and you just have to kind of, you know, just let, let what is be, really. Yeah. Mm. Interesting answer. <laughs> do, uh, do any of you have questions for any of the other panelists? Not, nope. <laughs> I just wanted to say one thing about the uselessness of the men in the novels and say that my choice of Edward Bone is that in some ways he is not useless. You know, of, of all of the characters, he's the one that when he invites Mildred for dinner, she thinks that he's inviting her to cook for him, but he's actually cooking for her. And they have that sort of um, misapprehension um, between them, which causes a certain amount of friction. And he also, an unsuitable attachment, he's a very good guest. You know, he's the one who uh, is very hospitable uh, mm -hmm. throughout. And he says that he has, he professes his faith, that he rediscovered his faith and he brings that up. And for someone to, to confess that and at a party, I, it impresses me tremendously. You know what I mean? It, it seems so intimate and it leaves you so open to, you know, certainly the academics, the anthropologists are like, what? <laughs> what? Um, that he, uh, he seems to have the strength of character that, you know, maybe he uh, is, is, um, strong enough to recognize Mildred's other qualities rather than just her usefulness. Mm. But she may have to index that book. <laughs> and I bet For she free. did. In fact, in a subsequent novel, you know, there's reference to her indexing his work, but never mm. mind. That's I found myself particularly interested in Mark in the story, even though I focused on, you know, the mature culture that yeah. was primarily about women, I found myself rooting for him and hoping that by the end of the novel, the, the question that Sophia asks her of herself and of, you know, she thinking about all the people that went to that trip to Rome, what did they all get out of the trip? And each one of them, she said, Elianthe realized she was homesick and wanted to go home. Uh, she talked about Penelope. She wasn't sure exactly what Penelope discovered, possibly love, but she wasn't sure. But herself, of course, Sophia talks about how it wasn't a rekindling of her, her marriage or her vows with her husband or that feeling that she was, you know, she was glad to be married to him, et cetera. But the, the lemon leaves, you know, and the, the mm. lemon raisins in the middle. But there were a couple of moments in the book where I was constantly thinking about Mark and how he was so underdone in the story. And again, it could be that it's one of her earlier novels, so she would have developed, you know, but, but at the same time, it's almost, it's, it's that aspect of the curate that is not, he's not very well developed. And so it begs the question of, well, why not? You know, why wasn't Mark developed further? Why is he so kind of in the background or, you know, almost denigrated by some of the commentary that Sophia does, except at the beginning of the novel when she and her sister are out shopping 
And she says, he's let me go on my, you know, little day with you to perk you up, Penelope, because you're sad and upset because you've had another love affair that didn't work. Um, and he says he'll get something for supper, to which Penelope says, yeah, he's not going to get anything. But it's, you know, that's that one little nugget where she shows the strong respect for him. And also about his sermons, you know, references to his sermons. And yeah, I just wish Mark had had a bit of a, a better role there. You know, I was sort of rooting for him, but it didn't happen. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think we'll call an end to this. Um, it's not an hour, but it's been 50, a good 50 minutes, which is, um, you know, about right. And do we have any last minute comments or anything you'd like to say before we dismiss? It's just been such a great opportunity, everyone. I mean, sure, we'd all love to have met in person, but, uh, yeah. you know, this has been very exciting. I've enjoyed it. Certainly kept me and my mind busy and thinking, and yeah. I've learned a lot today, too. So thank you. Well, you, you've done very well, all of you, especially, you know, I'm sure you wrote the papers or at least thought about the papers for that. What was it? The 19, which <laughs> 2019 conference was what? you were slated for and then yes it's, postponed yeah. and then postponed again yeah um so i was thinking that might be hard you know if i'd written a paper two years ago and i had to you know go back and you know think about everything that went into it it would be a little difficult to do i think so well but done. a very long conference yes <laughs> true <laughs> but the a good way all a good way yeah <laughs> the longest Kim conference on a record longest conference ever um but great fun so, well, I'm going to thank all of you and um, give Jordan the signal that, that um, we're going to finish and remind you that at 3.30 is that wonderful first time ever world premiere of um, a very funny adaptation, I'm sure, of an unsuitable attachment. They're always, always fun and uh, very enjoyable. So thank you all so much and thank you to the audience. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, we have stopped. Okay. Well, thank you, Jordan.